Hello, a very good morning to you and welcome to the BBC News at 9. The UK's top gambling companies have voluntarily agreed to stop advertising during live sporting broadcasts. The Remote Gambling Association, which includes the likes of Bet365, Ladbrokes and Paddy Power, came under political pressure over how much betting advertising is on TV. Our sports news correspondent Richard Conway reports. For many years, gambling companies have insisted that sport matters more if there's money on it. TV ads have encouraged viewers to bet before, during and after games. But now the UK's leading betting firms have voluntarily agreed a whistle-to-whistle -whistle TV advertising ban. It follows political pressure over how much betting advertising is on TV. More than 90 minutes of adverts were shown in the Football World Cup this summer. And anti-gambling campaigners say sports use of adverts normalises betting. Now, following extensive talks, UK companies have agreed no adverts will be broadcast for a defined period before and after a game is broadcast. Horse racing will be exempt, but all other sports will be included. Final ratification is still needed before the ban comes into force. But that should be a formality, according to industry insiders, and could come as early as this month. And Richard is with me now. So Richard, this is being described as uh, voluntary, but it certainly comes after a lot of political pressure, doesn't it? Yeah, huge political pressure. Uh, Labour Party especially instituted uh, a review uh, of gambling, uh, and this is one of the measures that they recommend, recommended. Deputy Leader Tom Watson, in a statement this morning, welcoming this move as a good first step. Um, but yeah, the companies have been talking amongst themselves, all of the big companies here we're, we're talking about. There's no one outside of this group. And what they've decided in two separate votes, I understand, is that they need to do this. They need to take measures because there is, you know, I think the public want to see this. And I think that that political pressure has told. They worry, I think, that if they don't act now, if they don't self-regulate, uh, then measures will be put upon them uh, perhaps maybe next year or, or the year after. So they've brought, sought to, to do this themselves, to look to be responsible. We have seen a number of responsible gambling measures taken by the firms uh, in recent years. This is the next step on, but it's a big one. Uh, what sort of impact is this going to have, first of all, on sport, Richard, particularly football? Because if you watch any of uh, the, the top two uh, teams in the top two leagues playing, there's a fair chance you'll see a gambling company on the player's shirts as a sponsor. Yeah, you know, sport and especially football's relationship with gambling is really entrenched. Uh, yeah, we do see a lot of sponsorship uh, from UK firms and foreign gambling firms on shirts, on perimeter hoardings. That won't change. We'll still see it online as well. This is a, a very distinct but a very uh, highly visual measure that the gambling companies have agreed to take. Yes, it does need to be ratified uh, in the coming weeks. I'm told that will be something of a formality given that they are all in agreement. But it is significant in that respect. It does lead on to questions about those wider issues of sponsorship and sports relationship with gambling in general. The critics of this type of gambling advertising, what sort of impact do they think this will have? Well, you know, the, the statistics are that there's around 430,000 problem gamblers in the UK. And I think the fear uh, from charities uh, and from those affected by these issues are that the impact on children, especially, you know, families sitting down on a Sunday or on a Monday night to watch Premier League football, to watch live sport, uh, are, you know, there's, there's a lot of this TV advertising goes on. Some of the companies, yes, have put in measures about, you know, when the fun stops, stop, uh, and, and, and socially responsible messaging. Um, but that hasn't been enough for some. So I think this measure will be, will be welcomed by them uh, as, as a way of potentially reducing the harm. But critics will look to it and say other measures need to be taken. It's still too much of a close relationship between sport and gambling. Uh, and just to uh, clarify, Richard, are we talking about live sporting events that start before the 9 p.m. watershed? So significantly, yes, that is the, the watershed is, is the mark, but majority of sporting events do start before that time. What the industry, uh, I understand, have said as well is if it's an 8 o'clock kickoff and, it, and therefore the, it finishes after 9 o'clock, that will come under this ter these rules as well. So there'll be a defined period before, nothing during, and then a defined period after where there will be no adverts. Okay, Richard, thank you very much. Richard Conway. Now, some breaking news just coming into us uh, about uh, some arrests that have been made in uh, relation 
to uh, extreme right-wing activity in the UK, say police. Uh, they have arrested uh, a number of men, a 21-year-old man from Bath, a 17-year-old man from London, and an 18-year-old man from Portsworth, Portsmouth, the 21-year-old arrested on suspicion of possessing material useful to someone preparing an act of terrorism and conspiracy to inspire racial or religious hatred. Uh, the 17-year-old arrested on suspicion of encouraging terrorism, dissemination of terrorist publications, and conspiracy to inspire racial or religious hatred. And the 18-year-old uh, arrested on suspicion of encouraging terrorism and dissemination of terrorist publications. Uh, the police say a number of arrests, a number of investigations and searches, I should say, are ongoing at properties in several cities. Uh, the arrests were made by officers from the Northeast Counterterrorism Unit, and it's understood uh, their investigation relates to activity by a neo Nazi group called the Sonnenkrieg Division. Uh, that news just coming in to us. Now, if you've been experiencing problems using your mobile phone this morning, then you are not alone as a massive network failure has hit O2. Customers, of which there are 32 million, have reported being unable to use data or the internet. The outage has also affected Transport for London, whose electronic timetable services at bus stops have stopped working. In a statement, the company said, We are aware our customers are unable to use data this morning. Our technical teams are working on the issue with high priority. Uh, we are really sorry and working as hard and as fast as we can to fix this. Well, some of uh, the customers have been complaining online about the outage. The problem was first reported at around 5.30 this morning as users up and down the country woke up to find they couldn't access uh, the Internet. Uh, the company is the second largest mobile network in the country behind EE with 25 million direct customers and millions more via the services it provides for the likes of Sky, uh, Tesco and GIFGAF. Well, let's talk to Adrian Bernard. He's a telecoms expert for more on this. Adrian, thank you for your time this morning. Um, just what is the, the status of this outage at the moment? Morning, Anita. There's no service um, re-delivery or go live again. There's O2 are tweeting um, that the data outage has been looked at. And it is only data, um, which is obviously much more important now than it was 10 years ago both consumers and businesses. So I, I, the software change in the network as the networks are upgraded and they continue works every day, I think that's taken out the data in, in the majority of the UK. So it's a significant fault. There is no clearance time yet released by O2 though. So, so tell us more about what you think might be behind this problem. Well, the data network going down today as opposed to 10 years ago is much more uh, inconvenient for consumers and business, but much more frustrating as well. 10 years ago, if we wanted to get hold of someone, we usually phone them. Now we reach for our phones to stay in contact with each other through media, media messaging. Um, the most important thing has been that in the use of mobile data has doubled in just the last year, 18 months. So whilst we're on the move, we are consuming a lot more data and using a lot more apps. So you mentioned that Transport for London being down. The mobile network operators' big push is into what we call IoT, the Internet of Things, where machines are connected to each other and rely on a constant and an active data signal. And for the mobile network operators' data network to go down, it's critical. Um, I think the issue is software related in the network. I was talking to an O2 source this morning who was traveling and pretty frustrated himself. Um, but as I say, there's no clearance time given yet. Is it possible to give us a, an educated guesstimate of when they might be able to fix this, perhaps based on problems that other mobile companies have had before of, of this nature? The, the longest outage of a mobile network operator was a couple of years ago in, in the UK with EE. Uh, we'll remember that. I think this will be cleared up by the end of the day. There'll be an enormous focus from the uh, network directors um, and the board and the CEO, uh, the C-suite decision makers at, in Bath Road, in Slough, at O2's uh, headquarters will be onto this issue today. It's it's very bad PR for them, and it's not just the O2 brand. It's all the what we call the virtual mobile network operators underneath them, Leica, Sky, GIFGAF, etc., Tesco. They're all affected as well. So it's it's pretty it's very bad for them. Uh, c consumers and users of the O2 service should make sure they're registered for the O2. Wi-Fi hotspot service, which is free if you're an O2 customer, so you'll be able to get free Wi-Fi, um, premium Wi-Fi if you're on the move 
and that might ameliorate some of the inconvenience. But as I say, you know, the, the latest reports from Ofcom say that over three of us are use mobile data when we're commuting, and of, of course, this is the it's peak time right now. Absolutely, lots of people will be uh, undoubtedly feeling frustrated. But uh, Adrian, thank you for talking to us about that story. Adrian Barnard, uh, telecoms expert. Now, a major review of mental health laws in England and Wales has found they're outdated and that sectioning is being misused. An independent report commissioned by the government says police cells should no longer be used and patients shouldn't be taken for treatment in police cars. Our health correspondent, James Gallagher, has more. Section because of an eating disorder. She was detained for four and a half years. The Mental Health Act is used to care for people when they pose a risk of causing harm to themselves or others, and it gives doctors control over their patients' treatment. At times, Georgie was restrained and fed through a tube. She says she had a very mixed experience. There's nothing as terrifying as being pinned down by several often unfamiliar males and, you know, injected to pass out and later wake up having no idea, you know, what's happened. The new recommendations include giving patients more rights over treatment, steps to reduce the disproportionate detention of people from ethnic minorities, and an end to people being held in police cells rather than hospitals. Our review is trying to bring the Mental Health Act up to the modern age, an act which does, of course, involve some element of compulsion. We can't deny that, but that should be reduced to, to the least possible, and we should put more emphasis on the rights that people have even when they're detained. Georgie welcomes the review's recommendations which will now be considered by government ahead of plans to change the law next year. James Gallagher, BBC News. The Prime Minister has said she is looking at the role of Parliament if the UK can't reach a deal on its future relationship with the EU by the end of 2020, meaning the Northern Ireland backstop has to come into force. She told the Today programme this morning that she was exploring, in terms of the sovereignty of the UK, the role of Parliament in being able to have their say in that. She also refuted, though didn't completely rule out suggestions, that Tuesday's vote could be delayed to give her more time to drum up support for the withdrawal deal. In that interview, the Prime Minister said she's considering how Parliament might have a role in going into and coming out of any backstop arrangement thought to be an attempt to convince more hardline Brexiteers to support her deal. But she also explained that while many in the Commons aren't happy with even the idea of a backstop, that any deal the UK does with the EU, be it the one currently on the table or a Norway or Canada model, involves a backstop in order to prevent a hard border. Well, the Commons debate is likely to start again at uh, about half past 11 this morning when the Chancellor will be outlining what he believes will be a new, unique relationship between the UK and the EU. So let's go now to Westminster ahead of all of that and speak to our assistant political editor, Norman Smith. Hello to you, Norman. Uh, so let's talk about that suggestion floating around this morning that the meaningful vote next Tuesday could be delayed. In your opinion, did the Prime Minister emphatically uh, rule that out in her interview with the BBC this morning? No, absolutely not. I think the door is still swinging a jar. That option doesn't mean that it's their favoured option, but very clearly Mrs May did not shut it down. She was asked a couple of times whether the vote could be delayed, and the obvious answer is no, but that's not what she said. I think she said the first time um, that there was now going to be five days of debate or four days of debate leading up to a vote and she sort of danced around it a bit. If you want to kill off the idea of delaying the vote, it's very easy. You just say, no, it's not going to happen. That is not what she did. So um, my clear impression is that it remains an option. It may not be route one, but they're leaving it there in case things really don't budge and she seems to be heading into a brick wall. Also, just talking to those who work with her, they too not willing to kill it off. So that idea that if everything else goes pear-shaped, you just pull the vote, still out there as a possibility, although, as I say, I don't think it's their desired strategy because, frankly, it looks weak and it's not altogether clear what it would achieve. I think there are questions about how decisions are taken as to whether we go into the backstop because ah. that isn't an automatic. 
Well, oh. I just said, it's not an automatic. Where, if we get to the point where we need to have an arrangement to, con to make sure we have this guarantee, we're guaranteeing this commitment to the people of Northern Ireland, that there's no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, mm. the point at which that would be necessary, if it happens, is with the future relationship, which we're negotiating the legal text of. You said it was a, it's a bit legalistic. It is legalistic in one sense, but we can't do that legal text negotiation till after we've left. So if that hasn't completed by the end of December 20. 2020. We need this continued guarantee for people in Northern Ireland for an interim period. The question is, do we go into the backstop? Do we extend what I call the implementation period? It's, it's uh, become known as the transition period. So in other That's words, we, we ex right, That's so a the possibility that has to be taken at that point in time. Ah. And what, what we negotiated is that actually it's for the UK to choose which of those uh, we want to go into. Now, we have to so, so part, agree so the terms. If we want to extend the transition period, we have to agree the terms of that with the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, th there are these questions about how you go in and then how you, if you're in the backstop, how, whether that continues, what the regulations are in there, all of these issues that I'm exploring, and I'm exploring in terms of the sovereignty of the UK, the role right. of Parliament, in being able to have their say but in that. But to be absolutely clear, the transition period, which is due to end at the end of the year after next, that could be extended, what, without limit, while we continue to discuss the backstop? Is that No, no, the withdrawal agreement says it could be extended for up to one or two years. And that's it? That's the, that's the implementation. And as, things stand, period. as things stand, you favour that? No, I didn't say. I didn't say that. You seem I to said... imply that you did, because you said you're looking for alternatives. Because no. you, you seem, if I may say so, to have accepted that you're not going to win on Tuesday. No, I know you I, haven't no, said that no, in I terms. I haven't said that, but John, at all. Now, apologies about that. We um, fired that clip a little before I'd explained what Mrs May was going to be saying about it. So let me post clip explain what she was talking about, which is significant, and that is looking at a possible amendment, some sort of new language which Mrs May could bring forward on this critical issue of the Northern Ireland backstop which has bedeviled the negotiations and really is the key uh, roadblock to any breakthrough in the Commons vote. What Mrs May now seems to be saying is she's looking at whether Parliament could have some additional role in deciding one, whether we go into the backstop and two, how we get out of it if the EU just keep going on forever and a day with these rolling negotiations. Nothing specific there from Mrs May, but you get the sense she's trying to find something which she can give to her Brexiteers, a bone she can thrust into their mutt to say, look, here is progress on the backstop. Will you now kindly back my deal? The difficulty, of course, is will the EU agree to any sort of changes? I think the short answer is they won't agree to reopen the withdrawal agreement. They've made that very, very clear. Mrs May has accepted that. But could they possibly accept an addendum? Some new wording around the withdrawal agreement which might just reassure enough Brexiteers to give Mrs May a hope of getting her deal through. Okay, Norman, thank you very much. And uh, we uh, understand that today's debate uh, focusing on the economy is getting underway at about 11. But just let me tell you some news we're just getting from the European Court of Justice. You might remember that at the beginning of this week, uh, the Advocate General for the ECJ, that's the ECJ's uh, most senior legal advisor, issued a legal opinion uh, saying that the UK can unilaterally withdraw from uh, Brexit without needing the approval of the other 27 uh, member countries. And we are now hearing that the European Court of Justice itself will deliver its actual ruling uh, this coming Monday, so the day before the withdrawal uh, meaningful uh, vote, meaningful vote taking place in Parliament if indeed it does happen on Tuesday. So the European Court of Justice, after that legal opinion earlier this week, will deliver its ruling next Monday, the day before the meaningful vote in Parliament. Uh, that's been expedited, of course, but it's coming very quickly and obviously with a mind to uh, what's happening here in terms of the political debate in the UK. Well, we're getting out and about across the UK to explain all the issues and how they affect you. Today, our correspondent Chris Page is gauging reaction from the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Londonderry was the crucible of the conflict and the cradle of the peace process. But more recently, it's been the UK city of culture with a great sense of creative momentum. 
the indie group Cherim are riding that wave. They're rehearsing their new single at the Nerve Arts Centre and hope Brexit doesn't disrupt their rhythm of touring. We've kind of grown up in a world where there was no checkpoints and stuff, but I mean, if that was to go back to that, we would be reverting ourselves back to a situation that was like before our time, you know, the 70s and stuff. And I don't think anyone wants to go back there. If you're going through airports or whatever and there's there's customs and stuff like that, if anybody's diff like got different passports or whatever, it's going to be a, a bit of a handling. So Hannah, Lauren and Nairi want travelling to remain smooth, efficient and orderly. The mood's more serene over at the Derry Yoga and Pilates Centre. Beautiful. But people here don't feel calm when they talk about Brexit. It's really frightening, looking forward for me and my grandchildren. I think a no deal would be a complete disaster. Having lived through the troubles the first time around, I would be very concerned about what will happen to the border. Probably the, the best Brexit would be just the deal that Theresa May at the moment is offering, but would be nice to decide. But what do those who voted to leave the EU make of the Prime Minister's Brexit plan? Taking back the borders and stuff like that there is good stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it deliver Brexit properly, do you think? Uh, I don't think so, no, no. Brexit's a good thing? Oh, aye. Get out. Do you think it's a good deal? No, hard Brexit. This city is a place transformed, but no one's sure what changes Brexit will bring. Chris Page there, our Ireland correspondent reporting from the Irish border. Well, the chief executive of the Road Haulage Association, meanwhile, is at number 10 today to discuss Brexit and the implications for the haulage and logistics industry. Uh, Rod McKenzie is their managing director of policy and public affairs and joins me now. Uh, thank you very much for coming along uh, to talk to us today. Uh, I think it's worth reminding our viewers, first of all, what the main concerns, the chief concerns of the industry are right now. Well, we need a deal, whether it's this deal or a deal with a nip, a tuck or a shot of Botox. I'm not too bothered, but it ne we need a deal. And uh, the alternative uh, is a cliff-edge Brexit, which is a, has very, very serious implications for, for our industry. Remember that this deal is a divorce deal, uh, and that triggers a transition period, which is vital for our industry to get ready to some, for some new trade arrangement and some new border and customs arrangement in the longer term. So if you need a deal, and the, the main deal that's on offer at the moment is Theresa May's deal, what does the industry think of that? Does it have concerns or is it reasonably happy with the, the, the parameters of that deal? Well, the D A deal is the most important thing, as I've said. And uh, if you look at the alternative, which is a cliff edge uh, Brexit on the 29th of March with no transition, uh, that is a very, very serious situation for the road haulage industry. It's serious because um, of, of border queues, potential border queues at places like Dover. Um, it's uh, very serious because of the permit arrangements that we would need to move trucks from uh, the UK to Europe and back again. There simply aren't enough permits to go around. 2,000 for around 40,000 trucks. That will put some firms potentially out of business. 2,000 permits and 40,000 trucks. Hmm. Well, clearly the math doesn't work there, does it? It doesn't. And, and the, there is an even greater difficulty with uh, HMRC and what they are saying that we would need to do in terms of form filling for some new customs declaration. Now, let me give you an example. One of our haulage companies uh, has 300 trucks a week uh, going over to Europe. Uh, on each truck are 8,000 individual shipments. Each of those would require an input declaration, an export declaration, and a safety and security declaration. That adds up to 7 million customs declarations a week for one firm. How is that ever going to be done? I mean, th that's fairly mind-boggling, Rod. Uh, um, how much preparation in general terms has the industry usefully been, being a been able to do at this point for whatever comes next? Almost nothing because the government has obviously and understandably been planning for a deal so they didn't want to talk too much about what would happen in the case of a no deal and we're now starting to get information from departments like the Department of Transport and HMRC saying this is what you would need to do but actually it's not very clear and yesterday HMRC issued a, a, a notice which uh, was so vague I could make n neither head nor tail of it. Uh, and there is simply not enough information that tells 
haulage companies what they need to do in, in clear and simple terms. Confusing, not enough of it, we're in trouble. Okay, Rod McKenzie from the Road Haulage Association, thank you very much for that. And breaking news just coming into us, uh, Downing Street is saying that the meaningful vote will take place next Tuesday, the 11th. Uh, there was some speculation around this morning that perhaps it could be delayed, that some were advising Theresa May that it ought to be delayed, but Downing Street is saying that it will happen next Tuesday. And just a reminder of that other piece of breaking news, uh, in the last couple of minutes, the European Court of Justice, we're hearing, will deliver its ruling on whether the UK can unilaterally revoke its withdrawal from the EU, abandon Brexit effectively, the day before the meaningful vote. Uh, that's next Monday, the 10th. Now, an alarming proportion of adults in Britain who are eligible to sit on juries remain confused about what constitutes rape. Uh, they, that's according to campaigners. A third of people surveyed for the End Violence Against Women Coalition said there had to be physical violence for a rape to have taken place. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, June Kelly. A video put out by Leicestershire Police aimed at victims. It urges them not to destroy evidence which could help to bring an attacker to justice. Research published today by the End Violence Against Women Coalition says there are still many myths and misconceptions about this crime and some still believe that sex in a relationship cannot be rape. Kathy was attacked by a man she just started seeing. He was convicted of assaulting her. She says it was definitely rape. I was actually sleeping. Um, so you're not aware and at the end of the day no means no. If you're in a position where you're not saying you're not, you're not consenting to it in, in any way, then it's rape. You know, it's, it, a lot of people stereotypically they think of rape as in being pinned down on a bed or dragged up an alleyway, but that's not how it is. Of the 4,000 people questioned for this research, 33% said if a woman was pressurised into sex but there was no physical violence, it wasn't rape. 21% of women said that if a woman had flirted on a date, she couldn't be a rape victim even if she hadn't consented to sex. And at 33%, the figure for men believing this was even higher. You're safe now. From now on, everything is at your pace. Across the UK, rape convictions have fallen. Prosecutors say it's important that strong cases get to court. But this research raises questions about jurors who are sitting in judgment on them. June Kelly, BBC News. The chief financial officer of Chinese technology giant Huawei has been arrested in Canada. Meng Wanzhou faces extradition to the United States on suspicion she violated sanctions against Iran. Uh, China's embassy in Canada protested at the arrest and demanded her release. Huawei said it had little information about the charges and was not aware of any wrongdoing by Ms. Meng. And our business presenter, Dominic O'Connell, is here. Um, Dominic, what more can you tell us about this story and uh, you know, what this says about the tensions between China and the U.S. at the moment? Well, she's not just any Huawei executive. She's a senior executive, but she's also the daughter of the founder uh, of, of Huawei, which in 30 years has gone from pretty much nothing to be one of the dominant suppliers of telecommunications equipment in the world. And this is what it's all about. It's about controlling the telecoms uh, uh, industry in the future. Uh, there's been a bit of form on this. So uh, uh, last year, there was a Chinese telecoms company called ZTE, which was fined $1.2 billion by the U.S. for allegedly selling sensitive telecommunications equipment to Iran and this looks like something similar but this is quite a, an, a, quite a big escalation because Huawei is much bigger and she of course is identified personally with the company and we'll have to wait and see what, it, what evidence the US brings uh, to show that she has uh, allegedly helped in breaking sanctions. It's about trade so we have this US-China trade war going on which is about intellectual property as much as anything. It's also about 5G because Huawei is trying to dominate that market for 5G networks and we've seen in, in recent weeks different Western countries excluding Huawei from those 5G contracts and yesterday here BT in the UK said exactly that. It would take some Huawei kit out of its t uh, mobile phone network. Okay, another business story around uh, then. We're expecting Ted Baker results, aren't we, after the uh, controversy we, over the, the hugging policy. The, the hugging policy. We've had them, actually. They came they're out right, they're right already. It was, a, it was a trading update rather than results. And, and really, the update was nothing to write home about. It said that sales were pretty much flat up a little bit. But everybody was looking at what the company would do about these allegations of forced hugging against its chief executive, Ray Kelvin. And the company said it's employed the city law firm Herbert Smith uh, Freshill to conduct what it calls an independent investigation 
Commission. That investigation will report to a female non-executive director of the board, a woman called Sharon Bailey, who's a former senior uh, executive at Microsoft. Uh, it's all about how they respond, I think, as, as, uh, mm. and whether they can make difference. The question for them is, is Ray Calvin absolutely uh, synonymous and integral to the, to the success of Ted Baker, or is he, or is he actually uh, able to be dispensed with? But they'll have the investigation first. Okay, Dominic, thank you very much for that. Dominic O'Connell. Now, uh, let's uh, have a look at uh, what's coming up on Victoria Derbyshire's program this morning at 10 o'clock. Here she is. Good morning. This morning, our investigation into what could be the latest house building scandal. Hundreds of new built properties have been constructed using weak mortar. The mortar in between the bricks is literally crumbling. Our program has found 13 housing estates across Scotland and England where it's a problem. I would never buy a new build house again. Now, the last year and a half has just been a love in hell. If it wasn't a problem, why are the NHBC and the builders buying houses back off of these people and then asking them to sign a non-disclosure agreement to keep quiet about it? It's going on, it's just not being talked about. It's the most popular story on the BBC News site right now. Join us for that exclusive story and the rest of today's news at 10 o'clock on BBC Two, BBC News and online. And it's time now for a look at the weather forecast. Here's Simon King. Hi there, Simon. Hi there, good morning. It's a much milder start to the day compared to yesterday morning when temperatures were well below freezing across Scotland. This morning they're above freezing. But we've got lots of cloud across the UK. Uh, a mild southwesterly wind bringing that cloud and also bringing in rain eastward today. It'll break up into more showery outbursts uh, through this afternoon, but even towards the southeast of England, there'll be a few showers here. Some brighter skies, a bit of sunshine developing across Scotland, especially the northeast, but a big difference in temperatures here. 9 to 12 Celsius compared to yesterday, 13 or 14 degrees for many parts of England and Wales. Up the average. Through tonight, more rain spreads in from the southwest, but really, as we go through Friday, uh, we've got an area of low pressure moving into northern parts, and that's going to give some really strong winds, gusts of 60, 70 miles an hour, perhaps even higher than that. Those strongs will continue for much of the day, and there'll be some sunny spells and showers. Bye bye. Hello, good morning. This is BBC News at 9 with me, Anita McVeigh. The headlines for you. An end to TV gambling, gambling adverts during live sporting events. Britain's leading betting firms sign up. Police investigating extreme right-wing activity in the UK have arrested three men on terrorism charges. Searches are ongoing at properties in London, Bath and Portsmouth, where the men are from, as well as in Leeds. A massive network failure hits mobile users on O2. Customers across the country are unable to use data this morning. New rights for those detained under mental health laws as a major review as the current system is outdated. Theresa May indicates she's looking for a way to ensure sovereignty of Parliament over the Northern Ireland backstop and refuses to rule out a delay to when the vote will take place, although number 10 has since said the vote will take place next Tuesday. The results of a major new survey of children's activity levels have just been released. We'll be speaking to the CEO of Sport England, Tim Hollingworth, shortly to find out more about that. It's time now for the morning briefing where we bring you up to speed on the stories people are watching, reading and sharing. And uh, Brexit, of course, still continuing to dominate. That crucial vote on Theresa May's Brexit deal is due on Tuesday and frantic work is going on behind the scenes to try to persuade MPs to support it. Many people expect the government to lose. This morning, the Times reported that cabinet ministers were privately urging Mrs May to put the vote off because they think the, defe the defeat will be so devastating it could threaten the survival of the government. But in the last few minutes, Downing Street has confirmed the vote will still take place on Tuesday next week. Uh, then two days after the vote, the Prime Minister is due to travel to Brussels to meet EU leaders. The Telegraph is reporting that they will offer to delay Brexit, uh, which is currently due to happen on March the 29th next year. The suggestion that the date could be delayed is likely to enrage Brexit-supporting MPs, putting Mrs May under 
even more pressure. Well, just over an hour ago, she spoke to the Today programme on BBC Radio 4 and warned MPs not to vote her deal down. What MPs will be thinking of, as I say, there are three options that are available to people. One is that we leave the EU with a deal, and this is a good deal, and it does deliver on the referendum, or that we have no deal. And, you know, there are some people who say, well, let's take no deal off the table. But actually, the only way to take no deal off the table is to have a deal and to agree the deal. Uh, oh, some, and there are some, if you listen to the debate that takes place in Parliament, if you've listened to the many questions I've been asked in Parliament, at PMQs and you know, when I made statements to the House of Commons on this issue, it's clear that there are those in the House of Commons who want to frustrate Brexit. I, I think actually the opposition are doing that. The opposition are just trying to... <laughs> and just and many of your own Brexit. colleagues, of course. No, but there are those who also want to frustrate Brexit and overturn the, the vote of the British people. Can you, That's not right. Can you, should you, are you thinking of giving them a separate vote on the uh, backstop? Is that feasible? The backstop is an integral part of the withdrawal agreement. So you agreement. can't separate it. And, uh, that well, cannot be done. As I said earlier, the backstop's an integral part of the withdrawal agreement, but the backstop would be an integral part of any agreement and of any deal that was negotiated with the European Union. And, and that's because we, we are committed Yes, the EU concerned from the point of view of obviously Ireland's a member of the EU, but we're committed to delivering for the people of Northern Ireland. They're part of the UK. And the problem is you have not been able, and I've said this before <laughs> in this interview, you have not been able to persuade enough of your colleagues in Parliament, in your own party and in the opposition, that it is the right deal. Therefore, it is highly likely, inevitable, many people believe, that on Tuesday night it will be voted down. Do you have any sort of plan B if some people say when that happens? Well, as I've already explained, there are three Indeed options you have. that people can Indeed look at. Indeed you have. Three yep. options that people can look at. Yep. And, and actually, I think the, the question, that question is not for me. That question is for those who say that they want to oppose this deal. What are the... You're saying back me or sack me then, in effect, aren't uh, you? Th th that question is for those who uh, want to oppose this deal. Because the options are there. There's a deal, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no deal, or no Brexit. And I think... You know, my view is that it is our, I've used the words duty, we've had an instruction from the British people to deliver on Brexit. Mm. And I think, you know, I think the, the, the worst thing that could happen from the public's point of view is that we have all these arguments in Westminster, uh, n not about you know, whether we're going to leave, we've had the referendum, but about the exact details of how we leave. And the risk is that we end up with no Brexit at all. So your colleagues won't wear it. Parliament will not wear it. That is the problem. And it's not clear to anybody, I think, what happens then. I mean, do you, for instance, do you think it is possible, even desirable in those circumstances, that there should be another referendum? No, I don't think that there should be another referendum. And the reason is very simple. We gave people the choice in a referendum as to whether to leave the European Union or not. And they gave us a very clear message. They wanted us to leave the European Union. I know you may have spent a, a lifetime in journalism, John, asking people the same question again and again, hoping to get a different answer. Um, I, don't well, think it's right. I don't think it's right for Parliament to do that to the people. Uh, well, well, is it Parliament doing that to the people or is it Parliament saying to you, the Prime Minister, we've looked very closely at the agreement you've produced and we simply do not like it and we don't think it's best for this country. Uh, this isn't just no. a raggle taggle of half a dozen you know, extremists in Parliament. This is massive numbers. Let, let's be clear about a lot of the people who are calling for a second referendum. Hmm. A lot of the people who are calling for a second referendum want that because they hope there's going to be a different answer.